It's always a pleasure to come to KITP. Wonderful, wonderful venue and always exciting stuff to listen to. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, the term universality has come up uh, several times in this conference already. So I thought I would tell you what I think it is. Um, in many body physics, uh, universality is actually, a, usually the, the many body theorists have a very particular idea. I know from discussing with many body theorists that they have a very specific idea about what universality is and they get very irritated if you say it's anything other than what they think it is. Uh, has to do, uh, you know, something about scale and variance and critical exponents. But in few body physics, I think that universality is in the eye of the beholder. Basically, there's much less of a well-established definition, which is great. It means we can say we can decide what we we can decide what we want it to be. Um, and uh, generically, I would say universality means you can explain a lot with a little, um, except that you know the idea of explaining a lot with a little is more or less exactly all of physics, in my opinion. That's what, what makes something physics is explaining a lot of little stuff. So now we have a problem, but uh, uh, I'll just say that when, when we talk about universality, I feel like I know it when I see it. So here's an example I, which I think is maybe not universality, but I can't really defend this. It's more of sort of a feeling. Um, so for instance, uh, two very standard potentials, like we're model potentials in physics, uh, potential going as uh, R squared or potential going as one R squared, and the, uh, in one case, we have a very, very simple re result. The, the, we have equally spaced energy levels. In the other case, we have energy levels that follows this, also a very simple expression. I guess I want to say that this is not universality. I mean, yes, it's very simple, yes, it's, but somehow this is just an exact result from a potential. Uh, these potentials have been chosen to give us exactly this result. I, I don't know. It's a, maybe too simple, if you like. So my, this is not what I mean by universality, but if we go not very much more complicated the world of few body physics if we have a, a many electron atom, which is in principle an extremely complicated system. We have a high Z ion in the center and, and many electrons and they all interact via long range forces. Extremely complicated thing. They obey Fermi statistics as exchange terms. Very, very complicated. Um, and, but if we look at an excitation where we have a single, uh, sort of a single electron excitation, do the excitations go as minus one over N squared? No. But they do go as uh, minus one over with a little correction, uh, this little extra term here, which depends only on the angular momentum of this electron. It's a very nice result. Uh, everyone who's done atomic physics and many people who will have not will represent this as just old school atomic physics, call it a quantum defect. And in my opinion, quantum defect is, is very much sort of in the, in, the, in, the, in the variety of what I would call a few body universality. Um, basically you, you're, you have some distance away. This only applies when you're at a large enough value of n, you're at some distance away. A large enough value of n, but I should say not a very large value of n, it becomes quite accurate. You're some distance away. You, if you're a many body physicist, you might say, well, I sort of coarse brain over these things. I don't know, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so I, 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 that's, that's my personal opinion. But in any case, uh, everyone believes that FMOF trimers are an example of, of universal physics in few, body, in, in few body physics. I feel like I don't have to define this, I can't. Remember where I found this beautiful picture, except it was on the internet. Um, my apologies that if I have stolen your picture, I went back to find it and I couldn't this morning to, to have a, have a, uh, these are uh, obviously these, these look like planets, but I believe them to be atoms actually. You can see there's some weather going on on the surface of the atoms. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe it's a globular cluster. Anyway, we'll call it FMF. Um, and it's definitely an example of Fibati universality. And it's what I'm going to talk about today. I will, I will focus on three, the case of three identical bosons, which means I will, unfortunately, I will not be covering in my sort of review of the various previous results, I will not be covering the beautiful work of Cheng Qing, who does, uh, and, other, and others who have worked with uh, uh, places where the masses are not equal and with fermions and what have you. Okay. Uh, the experiments uh, were done by uh, graduate students, and I mentioned in particular Xin Xie, who uh, graduated just a couple of years ago. Um, and there are two different uh, advisors. My colleague Jun Yi and myself have advised this uh, work now for, for some years. Um, and, but I should mention that the, oh, and then uh, the theory work was done. Uh, we worked very closely with Jose Dinkao, who's here, and Paul Julian, who is also here and Matthew Fry and Jeremy Hudson as well. Um, we are missing a slide. Oh, this is the slide I'm missing. The experiments are done. I'm getting a little bit of a lag in my clicker. 
Okay, the experiments are done in the, 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 the lab, which was the lab of Debbie Jin. The, exper the apparatus was built by, by, by Debbie and her students. Uh, and this talk is dedicated to her memory. Um, I think we've already seen this, uh, this pictures like this many times showing the, the structure of, uh, of the FMOF bound states as a function of the scattering length uh, near a, a, a resonance, near a Feshbach, or near a resonance, in this case, a Feshbach resonance. Um, over on this side, these things look relatively triangular. As you get closer and closer to the uh, dimer continuum, dimer monomer continuum, they look sort of not so, not, they, don't, they long, no longer look like equilateral triangles. They look like a dimer with a, a halo atom around it. Here's just another picture of that same sort of squash, same thing sort of squashed down. Uh, if you aren't uh, Lev Kekovich, then you don't really directly observe these things. Instead, we can slide all this down. We Instead, we look at them. Usually these things are observed by looking at corresponding uh, features in the various inelastic decays. So for instance, this is the three body recombination rate, which comes to peaks, exactly where the trimer states come into to resonance with the three atoms. And there's additional features on, on this side. The <coughs> original, the thing that we sort of most often think about when we think about the universality, the, the sort of regularity, the patterns in this thing is that these things in a logarithmic way, this is supposed to be the log of one over A here or in one case, I guess it's the log of minus one over A over here. Uh, we think of these as coming for, for three identical bosons at this very regular inter interval of 22.7. But uh, there are uh, other interesting results and other interesting sort of universal ratios here that uh, I don't, I, I certainly learned them from uh, Eric Broughton's paper. But, uh, and they include, for instance, if we look on the positive side, uh, there is also a modulation in the three-body recombination rate. It's smaller in general, and it's not as, it's not as resonant. It's, it's, it oscillates in a sinusoidal way. But the peak of the three-body recombination rate should be at exactly the same value of A, except with a minus sign. So this is a, uh, this is a, a prediction, again, for sort of a connection now going across the, rate, across the pole. Another ratio is that the, the difference between the, the positive and the adjacent, uh, the, the maximum and the adjacent minimum should be a factor of 22.7 or this factor of 0.21. It's not really a separate number if you think about it. It's only really saying that this is not just log periodic, it's log sinusoidal in the sense that the, the minima here are logarithmically speaking halfway between the maxima. So the minima is just half of a cycle logarithmically speaking away. And that's uh, where, the, where the minima are predicted to be. Another prediction then is not for the three body recombination rate, but for the dimer monomer collision uh, uh, constant, which occurs, should come to a peak right when the trimer is resonant with the, the dimer monomer continuum. And interestingly, that, uh, this, is, this is now specific to the case of uh, three identical bosons, but that number is very close to minus one. It's minus 1.065. Um, so it's, uh, almost within, within, within experimental resolution, it's almost in the same place as the peak of the three body, um, the three body uh, recombination rate on that side. But it doesn't have to be. It's it just, it just it, I believe it's just to be an accident and it's specific to the particular case of three identical bosons. If you had two bosons of one mass and a boson of a different mass or something, this would not, these two peaks would not be the same. So you shouldn't think of this as being a, this, this peak in the three body recombination rate as being a consequence of this degeneracy down here. Um, and then, oops. Finally, uh, you can characterize all of these. These are all sort of ratios. If you want to make this into an absolute sense, you can describe this, this pattern with one more number, which is you pick one of the resonances uh, and you say, well, how far is it away from some dimensional number like the van der Waals length? And uh, that's, that's one more sort of ratio. And generically, this was thought to be nothing, you know, dependent on um, three body terms, uh, short range physics and what have you. But uh, interestingly, this was the, the a, a call it a universality on, on this number was the first feature that was, uh, th that really seemed to have universal nature when, when it was observed. Um, it's uh, difficult to see, you can talk about this being an infinite spectrum of states, 
Um, but as, an, as a practical, like you think, well, there's, you know, these go up by a factor of 22.7 or 22.7 squared all the way up to the continuum. But as a practical matter, that's not really true. You could call it the infrared problem at very low energies or very long wavelengths. Uh, basically, these, these two states are too weakly bound compared to the temperature or compared to the dense, the size of the cloud of, of, the, of the dimers are too large compared to the density or the binding energy is too small compared to the temperature for these to be seen experimentally in any realistic experiment. And uh, then there's sort of an, uh, oh, there's also a ultraviolet problem if you wanna think about that, which is where here the experiment, the, the red side, the experiment falls on the, on the, on the ultraviolet side, the, the theory model fails. You get to deep enough energies or short enough length scales and the short, the short range physics becomes important. And unfortunately for most realistic systems, there's really only, uh, we'll see there's maybe only three or four features which are observable in here. So it's not actually possible to see a, a very wide range of, of uh, you know, see a wide range of this, of this universality. And it was interestingly, as I said before, in this, in this not so very Fomovian number, which is just where is the location of the, of the first resonance with respect to an, a, a dimensionful number where uh, people first saw uh, universality. What is this van der Waals length? Um, you can't even see it on here, but this is a, a fairly realistic potential that decays as one over R to the six, and you cannot, can't even see that it's different from zero there. Um, but uh, we can, come up with a length, basically we take the, the, the coefficient that goes in front of the one over r to the six, and we multiply it by enough powers of h bar and raise it to an appropriate, appropriate power so that we get something of, of dimensions length. Uh, and I can't say much more about it than that, but I do have a, a physical understanding of the van der Waals length, which is, you know, the, the scattering length is, uh, you think of the scattering length as the, the wave function comes in from far away, and at some point that you can sort of, you can extrapolate down and see where it will encounter the, the axis here. And that's the scattering length. Um, but the wave function does not, doesn't actually do that. It actually comes down and crosses. So you can sort of think of the scattering length is what you expect from the wave function. And the zero crossing is what you get from the wave function. And that's within a factor of order unity, the van der Waals length. So this is uh, as sort of a relatively easy way. It's not, it's not a precise relationship, probably within 30% or something like that. It's where you really do have uh, zero crossings and what have you. And indeed, if you take uh, people discovered, and this was you know, a really surprising result at the time, that if you look across many different resonances and many different atomic species and measure the, a location of the, of the three body recombination peak on the negative side, and normalize it by the van der Waals length for that particular atom, you get something which comes in right around nine and a half. Um, and this was observed in sort of accidentally really an experiment. But uh, soon after someone pointed this out, there became, uh, it became clear to people who have better understanding of few body theory than I do. Uh, it became clear that, yeah, this actually made sense. The way it was explained to me, and I'll give you just the words is that the hyper radius, which is sort of a combined radius of the, of the three atoms, experiences a hyper potential. And there's a, um, a sort of a turning point in that, which is set by the van der Waals length and uh, call it a barrier. And uh, that sets the, the, the location of that first energy. It, it, it's an effectively a one over R squared, sorry, a one over um, R squared potential, yeah. I think earlier <laughs> when I was telling you about few, uh, few body universality, I presented the Coulomb potential as one over R squared. I happen to know that it goes as one over R, the potential. And so in case you are wondering, we will go back and fix that. Uh, it's the force that goes over one over R squared. Um, you know, Chris Reed taught me everything I know about atomic theory. So if I got that one wrong. Uh... <laughs> okay, that was a little embarrassing. I'm thinking, well, of course the three body potential goes as one over R squared, but I already said one over R squared. Ah, okay, good. I made the slide, the slide late last night, which is when I make my best slides, except for problems like that. Um, if you make, uh, if you, the, the x-axis here actually is uh, something like a width of the, of the Feshbach resonance, of the underlying Feshbach resonance. I'm not gonna talk very much about this parameter. It's, it's not a fully, there's some, there's some problems, let's say, with this as a way of characterizing resonances, but, um, uh, Willy Zwerger and, and Schmidt came up with a theory that said, yeah, we actually expect that this, 
this uh, universal ratio will, will really only apply for relatively large widths. And as you get narrower, there should be some sort of diversions here. Um, this was sort of the status of things. And we came along and we thought, okay, we are going to, our approach is that we are going to make uh, precision measurements. We're going to take a, 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 a Jilla, both Jun Yi and I are, uh, uh, when we're not doing cold atoms, we're doing very precise physics, measuring things to 10 digits or something. Can we do few body physics in a, in a precise way? And so uh, this actually was our, our first measurement attempt at this. And, you, and this was our measurement of the, the location of this resonance uh, in potassium 39. And I, what I wanna bring to your attention is that the error bars are extremely small compared to, to these things. And um, I wanna say this delicately, uh, our approach was not only to have small error bars, but also to get it right. Um, which is a separate issue from having small error bars on your plot. Um, so we said we brought a precision mindset, uh, small error bars, accuracy in the sense of making sure the real answer is in fact inside these error bars. To do this, you have to really pay attention to effects of finite temperature and finite density. You have to avoid misidentifying peaks and that's best done through an absolute density metrology. See that it basically, uh, there's a various consistency checks to make sure that you're really measuring a two body and not a three body effect or not a Feshbach resonance when you think you're measuring, all these sorts of things. And then a very carefully calibrated value of A as well in order to make all these things quite precise. So this is the approach we took and um, we made this measurement and uh, we thought, well, it'd be interesting to sort of uh, see if we can see these effects of, of, of depending on the width, but it's actually very difficult. This was a hard measurement to make and doing this across many different atomic species uh, it's one thing to do with many different atomic species as a theorist, as an experimenter, to go to many different atomic species. Each one requires sort of a million and a half dollars of equipment and, and many, many graduate students and even different resonances can be. So we decided, okay, we won't do that. We won't try to really investigate uh, the sort of width versus um, offset effect, but we were able to say that at least for this potassium 39, there, it is a distinctly non-universal value. This is a sort of, this is measured at sort of an intermediate width or resonance, and it's really not nine and a half. It's really close to 14. So we can say that with, with quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a degree of certainty. No, I'm sorry. It's just, uh, I just plotted it. it. It's the same. No, that's, that's the only plot. We can, we can see it back there. I, I, uh, it's, the, it's the graph that's moved up, not the point. <laughs> There was a line, uh, it's just the line there that uh, doesn't go through the, you know. So. Um, so we decided not to pursue this just because it was too hard um, from an experimental point of view, but we thought we can do other universal stuff. Um, and what are the other universal stuff to do? Uh, consistent with these sort of limits, there are one, two, you know, a feature here, a feature here, a feature here, maybe one or two features up here that we could look for. What if we go and just try and characterize as many of these features as we can and measure them with the same sort of level of accuracy. In particular, what if we really look into this uh, <coughs> across the resident Feshbach pole measurements? As we came into it, the, in, in for three identical molecules, besides this, uh, this offset measurement here, the only real measurement there was uh, that was, I mean, the, the measurement, there was one measurement uh, from the Innsbruck group which uh, saw this second generation peak here. Uh, this peak was, the height of that peak was almost surely suppressed by, by finite temperature effects, but the cesium resonance is so very narrow compared to a lot of other ones that they were able to see this peak, which actually sort of surprised me at the time. I realized later it was because cesium is a narrow resonance and it poked out of the, out of the thermal haze, if you like. This is, we have sort of a cloud here of, the, there's a lot of thermal haze in few body physics and, 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 and cesium, they were able to see this peak and saw something very close to 22.7. The other uh, sort of looking at sort of ratios back and forth across, the situation was, I would say, not fully convincing. And I'll, I'll um, so basically I'm going to report uh, various, uh, give you sort of a survey of various measurements of this, the dimer monomer peak, the peak in the three body recombination rate and the minimum of the three body recombination rate. And I'll express them all in terms of measured ratios between the first, the, the peak of the three body rate over here. So basically I measure that ratio, that ratio, that ratio. Um, at the time people were doing experiments in lithium, potassium and cesium. And uh, so down here, this represents, so this is the predicted location. Uh, this is actually should be a minus sign here, predicted location of the of the, uh, the, the minimum of the three body uh, uh, 
the three body recombination rate. And you can see that uh, in the various, in some cases, the, the deviation was really quite large. Um, and uh, the, this, uh, the pale powder blue line here corresponds to the location of the atom dimer cross section and in cesium. Uh, agreement here was not, uh, not especially good. The, uh, the lithium experiments in Israel, uh, looking at the peak of the three body recombination rate on the positive side, were actually uh, relatively encouraging. But at the time, as we were getting into this, there was a general feeling that, you know, it's not necessarily that these predictions are wrong, but they they're certainly don't seem to be particularly precise and maybe experimentally, this, these are not really uh, just, you know, by the time you include the specific aspects of specific molecules, maybe you have to, maybe these are not really possible to see. I want to mention that because everything is modulo mathematics, right? The, the, everything recycles around every factor of 22.7. So if you measure a ratio, which is different from the predicted ratio by the square root of 22.7, that would be maximally wrong. Right, that's as far wrong as you can possibly be. If you're any more wrong than that, then you just module, you do modular arithmetic. So, and therefore, the square root of that is basically if you see, if you're wrong by a factor of 2.2, that's a no signal result. Experimentally, that means you're just as close to seeing the right answer as the maximally wrong answer in logarithmic space. And you can see that. Uh, so for instance, the locations of the, of the atom dimer um, in cesium, the locations of the atom dimer peak are essentially no signal results. They're about a factor of two away. Uh, in in, in uh, rice, the location of the three, body, uh, the three body minimum in lithium, also pretty close to a no signal result. And even, uh, even this one is not especially convincing in potassium 39. Here and here, yeah, these are, these are not overwhelming accuracy, but you might imagine that there's hints of this result, but in, if you're measuring, you know, in two different species and three different species and, and three different resonances and one, two, three, four, five different families of measurements, if only two of them seem close to the universal prediction, it's not, it's not very convincing. So one thing we tried to do is measure all, all three of these ratios, which means measuring four features, three ratios, in order to see if we can uh, see what we see in potassium. Again, uh, for seeing three body recombination, we cool the atoms, we let them sit in the trap, we adjust the magnetic field, they decay. Uh, we do that, we vary the amount of time we do that, we look at various different densities and temperatures, we extrapolate the data to zero temperature, because it's a zero temperature theory. We repeat for different values of A and identify peak loss on the feature in the FMOF diagram. So when we do that, this is now the three body loss on the, uh, unfortunately, I've changed it. No, I haven't. I've, this is the three body minimum here and the three body maximum that we measure. And we don't fit this to a sine wave with periodicity 22.7 because we don't want to assume that these are separated by the square root of 22.7. We do a separate fit to find the peak and a separate fit to find the minimum. And we tried to find this secondary minimum here. We tried actually to look for uh, across an entire generation and find this minimum here. It's difficult because you get to, as I say, if you get to high enough values of A, things fall apart experimentally. And I'm not gonna go through this list, but there's like five, 10 different ways. Oh, looks like seven different ways things can fall apart when you try and measure A too high experimentally. It gets really hard. Yes, thanks. And you can see that our, our data bear that out. So this is, these, these data are done at various different temperatures and various different densities. And if we were getting a consistent result, this should, should look something like a local minimum here, and it doesn't. So we weren't able to see that. Uh, but we were able to see the peak, and we found that the, oh, sorry, now talking about the atom dimer, uh, the, the, the peak of the atom dimer recom, uh, inelastic scattering process, where the di a monomer collides with a dimer, and the dimer decays to a deeply bound state, and the monomer flies away, and everything disappears. For, to make those measurements, um, we do something different from what Lev, Lev Kekovich does. We actually uh, start with three, three atoms. We jump the scattering length by very rapidly changing the magnetic field to the peak of the resonance where the, uh, basically there's a strong mixing between the different states. And then we again, jump quickly back out again and we create monomers and dimers. And we just watch the, the monomer population eat the dimer population and we can measure the decay rate in that way. Uh, and we did that, and here is the results measured. Uh, you can see the peak of the monomer dimer uh, inelastic rate at various different temperatures. And if you just treat this naively at the various different temperatures, you see a peak which is changing with temperature. 
In principle, you could measure this at many different temperatures and extrapolate to zero, but it's not going to zero very fast. You can also use a theoretical method to actually do a finite temperature correction on each, at each peak, and you can find that this is the same data with a, with a theoretical finite temperature uh, applied to it. You can see we measure a flat line independent of temperature there, which is converging to the same place as what I call a naive analysis would converge. We just can't go to lower temperatures to get all the way to where they cross. But we feel like we understand the temperature corrections. Without that, you can't get very close. You can see here at this high temperature, we're missing by you know, 30% or something. Okay, so <clears throat> here's where we were. And now, roll of the drums, here comes the Jiller results. And we can, you can see, first of all, that they have very small error bars. This is the peak of the three body rate. You can see it's basically exactly right. This is the Bonhoeffer dimer uh, recombination rate, which is right to just about 6% or something like that. And this is the, the minimum, the local minimum in the three body recombination rate, which is sort of as, as the least good in terms of agreeing with universality. It also happens to be the one which is measured at the lowest absolute value of the scattering length. So presumably we're getting the one which is most affected by uh, finite range physics. So for this, we expect uh, 1.07, we see 0.97, I guess that's 10% different. Uh, and it's interesting, sorry, let's go back one. Uh, because we're comparing uh, this generation, this lowest generation of, of uh, FMOF state to the crossing point of the next generation up, the fact that this is so close to its predicted value actually implies an FMOF spacing between these two of 20.6, which is close to 22.7. Um, we, uh, on the location of this, we see it within 4%, and this it looks like about, it's, it's a little bit further different. Um, we, can, we can express these sort of in this logarithmic space. These are good to uh, just a few percent. Our worst measurement is off by 0.08 in terms of a fractional, uh, as a, in terms of a logarithmic, logarithmic fraction of 22.7. 0.25 would sort of be the no signal result. 0.5 would be the maximally wrong result. So this is in, in reasonable agreement. And in terms of accuracy, uh, we have Jose Dincal on board, and he's able to tell us that um, if he, he's able to do actually the finite range corrections, and you can see that this is his predictions, and uh, yes, our, 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 our answers very a little, differ a little bit from the universal ones, but they agree quite well with a universal treatment corrected for actual finite range physics. You can see we're all within, just we're all within the error bars here. This one is almost within the error bars. And as a bonus, um, we're actually able to measure the widths of three of the resonances, and they're all the same to within about plus or minus 20%. So I haven't talked about the widths, but FMOF features come with peaks uh, and you know, location of the peaks and the widths, and they're all characterized by this number eta. In a fully universal picture, you'd expect the widths to be the same for all of these resonances. They're not exactly, they sort of expand about 40% or plus or minus 20% from the average. So what I want to leave you with is not a black screen, <laughs> but something more exciting, is that things are looking good. Um, and there's not, barring some, Okay, we're trying to do an experiment in the space station where we can get to much lower temperatures and much lower densities, and we might be able to get see a few more of these lines. But until, until if and when that happens, until then, uh, this is about as good as I think you're going to do. I think it's somewhat ironic that the potassium-39 has a, a rather non-universal offset from uh, our van der Waals. And yet the, it's in potassium 39 that we've been able to see the best agreements between the various FMOF peaks. I think it's maybe not fully coincidental because this number, instead of being 9.4, is 14. It means all of these are moved to higher values. All of these are also moved to higher values. So all of these things are a little sort of deeper into the universal regime, farther away from our van der Waals. And that may be why they agree better than other species. It may also just be because we've measured them really, really well. And I think these are, I'm here to tell you these are the right answers. Um, it's not actually easy to do. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Uh, now, now we open up the floor for the discussion. Um, 
there is somebody looking for uh, questions uh, from uh, people online, but there is first one question. Is it on? Yes. Thanks, Eric, for the really interesting talk. I just have a really, maybe a naive, theorist question, which is, is there some advantage to maybe doing these kinds of experiments, but in a, you know, a flat trap or a box trap where you don't, you can get rid of the kind of inhomogeneities of the density effects? I mean, is that is that a big effect contributing? No, <laughs> no, it's um, <clears throat> excuse me, we uh, there's an inhomogeneity of the density, but the cloud is we start with the cloud which is well thermalized. We know its density distribution and we know how to do that integral. Um, what will happen is as the cloud decays, uh, it decays um, those sort of lower energy particles, which are closer, uh, spend more time close to the average of the center of the trap, decay faster, and the cloud leaves thermal equilibrium. And this is actually a great source of, uh, a, a standard source of potential error, which is the cloud gets hotter. And if you don't, if you're not aware of that, your cloud can, uh, the, the decay can happen even time scales faster than the, the re-thermalization. And so your cloud is not only hotter, but out of thermal equilibrium, and it can very much contribute to error. We avoid that by instead of uh, making the cloud, and, and oftentimes people like to get good signal to noise by letting it decay across a factor of 10 and then fitting it to some sort of non-exponential decay for an inelastic loss. It's better to instead let it decay only 40 or 50%, uh, and then, but just do it at many different initial densities. So that's one of the, the secret sauce of doing these things precisely, is don't do the long decays, because they'll almost always confuse you. If you had a box, it would avoid some of that problem, but it would still be the case that the temperature would change. Uh, thank you, Eric, for, I mean, I really appreciate the, the precision when you went you know, introduce the precision into three-body physics. That's uh, something that was always missing. Uh, and I was excited to see that you can really put this name on your paper without uh, having to see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, fight back from, from other people. <laughs> so um, anyway, Maybe they so just keep I, it to themselves. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just wonder, so there is a, a several feedback resonances in potassium 39, right? So there is uh, several different possibilities to choose. So, and I wonder why do you choose this specific one uh, and why, you know, you were concentrating on that? It's true. In potassium 39, there are multiple Feshbach resonances. And uh, this happened to be, it, it had the nice combination of being relatively broad which makes it easy to, you don't have to, you're, you're, you're less sensitive to noise in your magnetic field. That's one advantage. Another advantage of this resonance is that it was at relatively low magnetic fields. So we could keep uh, for the same fractional in magnetic field energy, it's a better absolute magnetic field. <laughs> um, so those were the two main reasons. Uh, uh, I know that uh, Zoran Hadzababich's group in Cambridge, England have uh, investigated many of the other resonances. I mean, our hope would be was that some of the other resonances would have, for instance, a radically different eta. I mean, that would be really nice because that, that uh, especially a, a smaller eta for narrower lines would be a, a route to a more precise thing. Uh, the uh, potassium 39 is, is, is handicapped really by a relatively broad set of resonances. Eta is 0.24 or something. Uh, we know that eta can be as small as 0.05, and that would be, everything is much easier to find the center of a narrow line. But my belief is that um, empirically, the values of eta, uh, again, these are not easy things to measure, but I know that the, I don't think it's published yet, so I probably shouldn't speak, but I, I believe that maybe there's not, they don't vary very much between the, the potassium states. I, 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 I hear this, informally. So I don't know if that's, I'm not sure if they're ready to release that or if they have even, but so uh, if we had uh, infinite time and energy, we would go and we would have gone and, and more carefully, but it's, it's again, it's not just so, it's not so easy just to quickly look at the resonance and say, oh, there's eta. Eta is a number, basically the width is very strongly influenced by temperature. And so unless you're willing to really think very carefully about all the temperature corrections and things like that, you can't really get a good measurement of eta. 
And we, we were tired after this. We didn't have the energy to go and look at all the other residences. <laughs> May also. Uh, okay, so just uh, a, a little comment. So we already discussed it several times, but and um, so it, it's it's really um, we see a lot of differences between the eta and the lifetime of trimers. Yes, probably not. Probably this is something different that we are looking for. So we are still you know debating this uh, exact result, but. It might be also a, a more general for other species. So we are waiting still that somebody will take the uh, glove and uh, try to, uh, uh, you know, compare the ETA with the uh, some different type of measurement. So at least in our case, this is really different. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm I, I'm fascinated by your very very long lifetimes. Just going back to the stable, it's here somewhere. Oh, sorry. I went to the wrong, ah, there it was. Um, yeah, I mean, lithium is, is, perhaps it's very exotic, I don't know. I mean, I, I know that uh, when, you're measure, when you're measuring this, these, uh, this uh, the, uh, the peak of the three body rates at a relatively large value and of the, of the scattering length, and maybe it, things are, are better behaved there, but your, both your, but the the dimer is my, my memory is quite small is at a, a relatively small scattering length where uh, I don't want to call it exotic physics because it's not so it doesn't involve charmonium or anything like that but <laughs> but it is after all uh, short range physics I, I I don't know it's it's quite mysterious. Yes, please. Yes. Eric, I greatly appreciate your bringing in the concept of universality of the complex atom with quantum defect theory. I think that's a very beautiful example of a kind of universality. Van der Waals universality actually operates very similarly. It's a really powerful analogy in that, well, in a Coulomb potential, you get this one over n squared with the shifted levels, yeah. which are associated with quantum defect. In Van der Waals quantum defect theory, if you specify the S wave scattering length, which is a surrogate for the quantum defect, you, you have basically specify the entire spectrum of bound states and also the phase of the scattering far away from threshold below and above, mm -hmm. and not only for the S wave, but for all partial waves. So this Van der Waals universality, actually, which you showed the theory there that agreed so well with, with your measurement, uh, makes some really nice corrections. So the, the essence of Van der Waals universality is basically very similar to the essence of the atomic physics uh, quantum defect theory that's so effective for even multi-configuration atoms. So I just want to make a comment about that, but mm. I do appreciate your bringing that in because it gives an opportunity to make that comment. Yeah. I think uh, quantum defect theory is an underappreciated gem in the world of free body physics. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say I'm into that. <laughs> so do you have another question yeah um did you look at four body features as well or did you try to look at them and then you know if so did you sort of just run out of steam or or did you decide it's we, not as fruitful we tried very hard to, to see the four body features and i think that i, I think that uh, with the larger value of ada it's harder to I mean the, the the four body or three body features are not very far apart uh and so we go to where we think maybe it will be, and we look at the density dependencies, and maybe they're a little suggestive, um, but um, we did not feel confident about, about that. And so consistent with the idea of like, don't say wrong things. <laughs> uh, we, we did not want to report any of those things. We were, very, we were kind of disappointed. We wanted very much to see, you know, again, bring the sort of, precision metrology uh, spirit. And I think if we had had a, a better atom, you know, we can always blame the atom, right? An atom with a, with a smaller value of eta, I think we would have had a better chance of doing that. And, and, and still, I think would be interesting to do, very interesting. Eric, can you comment on the loss mechanism? I mean, you have this larger recombination rate. Is it well understood? Uh, the loss mechanism is, uh, is I think pretty well understood, and it, it tends to be uh, atomic atom specific but for the same, same reason that eta, the width is atomic specific. So basically, it's decaying to uh, uh, the, 
it's decaying to deeply bound uh, dimers. Basically, a, th a three a, a, a trimer decays to a deeply bound uh, a, a dimer, which is so much more deeply bound that the monomer is ejected and the energy of recoil is so large that all three atoms leave. It's, it's more closer to a chemical bond, although in fact, and I think we might even hear a talk about this later, I'm not sure, uh, if they don't, the, the preference is not to go down to fully short range, super deeply, but just, uh, you know how it is in a one over R6 potential, the next one down is really quite deep, uh, by, on the scale of nano Kelvin of energy. You know, we're sort of in the world of, nan we're in a world of 20 nano Kelvin, and the binding energy could be tens or, or, or 100 or even uh, 500 nano Kelvin, but the next level down where it decays to is, is infinitely deep on that scale and, and you know, it's five micro Kelvin or something and it's gone and it's gone forever. Interestingly, I was thinking about this earlier, in helium three, uh, there is no more deeply bound um, state, which is why, you know, is why the helium three trimer uh, or the excited state trimer can live long enough to go all the way through the interferometer because <laughs> there's no deeply bound dimer for it to decay to. And so I think maybe uh, the, 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 the FMOF state in, in, in helium may be, may be infinitely narrow. The excited state, I'm not, I don't want to say that for sure, but when I was thinking, that was the first time I thought about it. I thought, well, like, they never talk about decay in these excited states. And I go, oh, well, what's it going to decay to? It's, well, there's no, where's the deeply bound dimer? There isn't one. They already, the, the lightly bound dimer is the only dimer. So, yeah. Uh, one more thing I should mention, which is that uh, for this potassium, Jose did a, a calculation of eta. A, I won't call it exactly a first principles calculation of eta, but really a microscopic calculation using the different spin channels and got surprisingly close. As far as I know, it may be the first time that anyone really calculated eta um, for potassium. I don't remember how close, but within 30% or something. Yeah. Just uh, curiosity, there is uh, any advantage to do the experiment for positive uh, scattering length instead uh, for negative uh, scattering length to see the, the two differences? Well, really, we when we do it, we're doing it for both. Um, the rate what we're reporting is, uh, of course, on the negative side, here's the negative side over here. There's no dimer, so these various features associated with the dimer don't exist here. And every, all those numbers we reported are a ratio between a feature on the negative side and a feature on the positive side. So all those numbers really should be negative numbers. Minus 500 bore, you know, uh, plus 1,000 bore over minus 500 bore, like that. So yeah, we, we, we definitely look on both sides. And uh, you know, in the world of, in the idealized world of point interactions and so on, this would continue to go. But by the time you get down here to minus one, there's, you're sort of back into the world of chemistry again. Time for discussion uh, is over, so we thank again the speaker. <laughs>